Senior for that introduction and, and thank you to all of you for having invited me to talk about my experience as a musician with hearing loss and a cochlear implant. I've also, as Senior mentioned, been asked to discuss the activities of the New York City HLAA chapter, which I will touch upon at the end. But first, I would like to give some brief background about my hearing loss. Uh, Senior alluded to some of it. But people often ask me if my loss was a result of my profession as a trombonist or if it is genetic. But the question is not that simple. Uh, it is true that I sat in the middle of a loud brass section and often directly in front of the percussion. But the people who were sitting near me were exposed to the same loud volumes and are fine. My father was quite hard of hearing by the time he died, possibly as a result of serving at the front in World War II. On the other hand, my older brother has only a mild hearing loss, which didn't develop until he was in his 70s. It seems likely that my hearing loss resulted from an inherited vulnerability to the loud sounds I encountered during my career. I got my first hearing aids in 1991, when my hearing loss was relatively mild with thresholds around 30 decibels, a loss which I might not have even noticed if I were not a musician. At that time, I only wore them in private because of the not unreasonable fear that I would lose work if people knew that I had a hearing loss. Although my loss at that time was not yet affecting my ability to play. But around 1996, I recall the Brooklyn Philharmonic playing a PDQ Bach piece that had a soft lyrical trombone solo. I struggled with it because I had no idea whether I was in tune with the rest of the orchestra. And that loss of confidence left me very nervous. I could still play loud pieces well. Around the same time we did Bartok Miraculous Mandarin which has loud sections going back and forth between the first and second trombone, and we nailed it. But I knew the end of my performing career was near. Compared, when my kids were young and watching Sound of Music on TV, Doe a Deer sounded to me as if it were in a minor key, which I knew not to be true. Hearing tests check your ability to hear pure tones. They are a combination but, but sounds in the real world, including musical sounds, are not pure tones. They are a combination of harmonics above the fundamental pitch. I'm not an audiologist, but I've always believed that my problems with pitch are the result of having different degrees of loss at different pitches, making those harmonics out of whack, not balanced the way I was accustomed to before my hearing loss. Rebalancing those hear harmonics would be extremely complicated and hearing aids or cochlear implants are simply not up to the task. By 1997, with my hearing loss progressing, it had become more important to me to hear people speaking than to continue a career which had provided a great deal of satisfaction for decades. I made the difficult decision to retire from my performing career and to come out of the closet without my hearing loss. Although my skills on my instrument remained intact, I was no longer confident of my ability to play in an ensemble. I didn't know if I was in tune, and I, didn't, I had trouble understanding the conductor when he spoke to the orchestra. Playing trombone in an orchestra can be stressful under the best of circumstances when everything is working but when my hearing aid was my hearing was failing uh, it exacerbated the stress and my nerves told me it was time to quit i did not want to to uh, compromise the quality of the ensembles in which i played nor did i want my career to be tarnished by poor performances at important concerts in major venues such as carnegie hall or the brooklyn academy of music I did play a few low pressure jobs in the following few years, park concerts, children's concerts, and played with some frequency until 2006. Giving up my performing career not only meant the loss of income, but a loss of my identity as a musician. 
I was more fortunate than some because I had the background in education that enabled me to pursue other occupations. I continued the work I had been doing as an administrator for several orchestras, which not only provided a livelihood, but enabled me to stay in contact with many of my musician colleagues. After 2008, I almost never picked up an instrument. At the 2019 convention in Rochester, I heard a presentation by Betty Hauck, a former professional violin and viola player who had given up her career because of her hearing loss, but had started playing again. Her inspiration inspired me to try practicing a few times, but the results were not good, and I didn't continue. When you have done something at a high level for a long time, it's not fun to do it badly. My hearing loss continued to progress over the years at the rate of about one and a half decibels per year, which is imperceptible, but over the course of 30 years is enormous. Such a gradual loss is insidious because you get accustomed to the change. But by 2019, when my loss was considered severe to profound, my audiologist said that I had reached the limit of what I could expect with hearing aids and she recommended that I consider a, a cochlear implant. After getting a second confirming opinion early in 2020, I decided on surgery for an implant, but postponed the actual surgery until March, 2021, when I was fully vaccinated against COVID. Before making such an enormous decision, I reached out to my HLAA friends with implants to learn from their experience and found comfort in hearing their success stories. One of them, Ruth Bernstein, who was here this morning, uh, she's an 88, nine-year-old force of nature who is, uh, has compared CI surgery to a facelift because it gets rid of brown lines caused by not understanding conversations. I'm happy to report that testing shows that my sentence comprehension and quiet has enormously improved with a CI, a finding that matches the improvement in communication my family and friends have noticed. Although I've also improved the noisy situation, uh, noise remains a challenge. Three, man, three months after my CI was activated, an email arrived announcing a week-long adult band camp in Interlochen, Michigan Arts Center. In high school, I had spent four wonderful summers in Interlochen at what was then called the National Music Camp. Those summers gave me the experience to become a professional musician without attending a conservatory or even taking a music course. For decades, I've wanted to visit the camp, but never got around to it. The email about band camp motivated me to practice euphonium a little. I was also curious about how playing would sound through my recent cochlear implant. The first day I tried to play was a disaster. I could barely make a note come out. It was a little better the next day and improved for a couple of days. However, my lip started to hurt and to swell. Putting ice on my lip half after practicing helped, but I probably would have given up if I didn't have camp and playing an ensemble as motivation. Gradually, I got into good enough shape to play in, in a band of serious amateurs and found that my endurance was sufficient to make it through four hours of daily rehearsal at camp. So on August 9th, after about 13 years of rarely picking up an instrument, followed by three weeks of practice, I boarded a plane to Traverse City, the airport closest to Interlochen, to attend the camp. Although it is occasionally called foreign symphony orchestras, the euphonium is primarily a band instrument. For those of you who don't know what it is, it is essentially a tenor tuba. Outside of the military bands, it's impossible to earn a living playing the euphonium exclusively. As a result, I mostly played trombone throughout my professional career, though some of my best engagements, such as a concert with the New York Philharmonic and a recording with the Empire Brass Quintet were on euphonium. I actually had started on the euphonium when I was eight because my arms were too short to play the trombone. At age 10, I took up the trombone, which became my primary in instrument 
but euphonium remains my first love because of its rich, dark sound. And if you're going to play in a concert band, as I did at camp, the euphonium parts are better than the trombone parts. And if you can't hear pitches and intonation well, valves are better than a slide. The other reason I started practicing euphonium rather than trombone is that it was in a lower on a lower shelf in the closet. The music program my audiologist installed on my new CI warmed up the sound, but it didn't improve my ability to hear pitch, which was already poor before I got my implant. With respect to pitch perception, the 22 electrodes in the CI cannot equal the approximately 15,000 hair cells in the cochlea, each tuned to individual frequencies. The truth is that I had no idea if I was playing in tune, but my neighbors in the band didn't complain. I did have a difficult hearing the conductor who was possibly 30 to 35 feet away in a large auditorium. As a result, when he would say, for example, start at letter B, I had no idea what he had said and tried to figure out, not always successfully, where the band was playing. I was not hiding my hearing loss. When I applied for the band, I informed them about my hearing loss, and I always wore my devices and sometimes turned to one of the players next to me to ask what the conductor had said. In retrospect, I should have asked them to speak more loudly, but part of me was still reticent about calling attention to my hearing loss. I was pleased to discover at that point in my life, my competitive juices were not flowing. At camp, I did not meet anyone else who had had a professional career as a musician, and I didn't care where I sat in the section or who played the solos. I had nothing to prove. All in all, I had a great time at camp. Because I had a career as a musician, I've been accused of being creative. The truth is that I was never creative, but I was good at my craft. And part of what I enjoyed about playing was the visceral sensation of producing beautiful sounds. Even with impaired hearing, it felt good to be doing that again. To do it as part of, a, of an ensemble was an added bonus. To cap off the terrific week, after the concert, I went to a Northwoods League baseball game, in part because I was intrigued by the name of the semi-pro team, the Traverse City Pit Spitters, who defeated the Kokomo Jackrabbits 9-2. to two. As someone who spent considerable time playing in Broadway and ballet pits in New York City, surrounded by brass players spit, the name Pit Spitters meant something different to me than to the residents of Traverse City, which calls itself the cherry capital of the world. The baseball players were all young college kids having fun playing a, a game they probably loved, but many of them were also hoping to be discovered and make it to the major leagues. I was struck by the comparison to my experience at band camp, which I enjoyed without any higher aspirations. Fast forward to 22 when I returned to camp. They announced that the conductor would be using a microphone when he addressed the band. I think this was a result of the magazine article in which I had mentioned my difficulty hearing him. The announcement was greeted by applause from the entire band, many of whom apparently also had difficulty hearing him. This is also a lesson for all of us about the HLAA message, which is not to be shy about requesting accommodations. When you need them, you are probably not the only one and also as a result of that article, an audiologist in Michigan has shown interest in working on music with children with implants. So how am I hearing today? My hearing has improved since implantation, although at a somewhat slower rate now that I'm in the second year. Before surgery, my sentence comprehension score was 62%. Within six weeks, it was up to 73%. At four months, I had improved to 85%, and at seven months, I was able to correctly repeat an astonishing 97% of sentences in quiet. Sometime during the year after my implant, I was in the country with my wife, and I told her that I heard a bird. 
what was remarkable was not that I heard the bird, but that I could identify it as a bird. In addition to understanding speech better, I was recognizing more sounds. I'm not a neuroscientist and cannot vouch, vouch for the act, scientific accuracy of some of the things I'm going to say. What distinguishes a bird song from a trumpet or a trumpet from an oboe playing the same note? Timbre, which I think is related to the balance of the harmonics that I talked about before. And my brain has relearned the pattern of harmonics of birds and oboes and trumpets. Nina Krauss, who was a neuroscientist at Northwestern University, has written a wonderful book of sound mind, which I highly recommend. It's about the role of the brain in hearing. In her book, she gives an example of a ferret, which has a neuron that responds to a preferred frequency of 8,000 hertz. However, when a pitch of 6,000 hertz is paired with a, with a reward, the ferret's brain shifts its preference to 6,000 hertz. Initially, when I got my implant, I assumed that the tuning of the electrodes imposed very strict limits on the ability to perceive pitch and timbre. But the plasticity of the human brain, like the ferrets, is amazing. Although I still believe there are limits on pitch perception with a CI, they are not as rigid as I had thought. I can now enjoy listening to music more than I could initially, and actually more than I could with my hearing aids alone. Prior to an implant, to my implant, uh, an orchestra was just a big wash of sounds. I could not separate out different instruments, but that has improved gradually in the almost two years I've been living with my cochlear implant. I'm now able to enjoy live performances more than in the past, including the Metropolitan Opera, the New York City Ballet, um, and Broadway musicals. For those of you with hearing loss who wish to listen to music, I would recommend starting out by listening to small ensembles before attempting larger ones. I've wondered about why I've been able to improve so much. It's difficult to know for sure. Certainly I would have improved somewhat without doing anything special. Exposure to speech and sounds helped enable my brain to process these stimuli and to learn to sort them out. But early on after my activation, I did go for auditory training, which was useful, and I think probably helped retrain my brain by making me focus on differences between similar speech sounds. As part of my training, I listened to some podcasts. In addition, my auditory trainer gave me homework exercises to do with my wife. All of that probably helped me process speech. As for music, although I don't have evidence, I suspect that using the Angel Sounds app, with, along with sitting at a keyboard and slowly playing scales, may have helped some. It is my guess that when I started to practice my instrument, it also helped possibly more than the auditory training, and possibly playing in an ensemble may have contributed. I believe that actively performing may, even, may be even more beneficial than passive listening. There are two ways of looking at my hearing and my performance. Will I ever hear music the way I did in my youth? Probably not. Even if I totally recover my skills, my physical skills on the instruments, I will not be able to resume my professional career. But with a different set of expectations, I am able to enjoy playing and to enjoy occasionally playing in an ensemble. There is also a sense of accomplishment to playing again, even with hearing loss. And thank you, Betty Howe, for having inspired me years ago to re resume playing and giving me better perspectives about expectations. It took a while for her advice to sink in that I'm now enjoying playing. And of course, it is gratifying that I'm better able to enjoy listening. There is more, one more thing I would like to do before talking about the New York City chapter. Our final chapter program before New Year's was a discussion among a panel of musicians with implants, several of whom gave brief performances. Although I organized and moderated the program, I was not a panelist. However, I concluded the program 
with a brief video of me playing a verse of Old Lang Syne on my euphonium. Today, in honor of yesterday's holiday, St. Patrick's Day, I prepared another video, a verse of the old Irish ballad, Danny Boy, which was one of the things Betty Howe played for her presentation at the convention and for the New York shift gears and tell you a little about the New York City HLAA chapter. I joined HLAA in 2016 at the suggestion of my audiologist when I was purchasing new hearing aids. I joined primarily because of the 5% discount for HLAA members. Also at her suggestion, I attended the convention in Washington where I discovered that there was a New York City chapter. HLAA quickly became an important part of my life. I enjoyed going to meetings where everyone faced the same challenges and where there was captioning as well as a loop. In addition to the camaraderie and support and friends I made, I also learned a lot. In 2018, I was asked to be vice president, and in 2020, I succeeded Catherine Bowton as president because she was limited to two consecutive terms. And 2022, when she was able to resume as president, I was happy to have stepped down. I'm very proud of our chapter. Shortly after the onset of the pandemic, we were able to quickly pivot to virtual meetings. Although we continue to miss the interactions of personal contact with our friends in the chapter, there have been some benefits to Zoom meetings we've been able to draw upon a much larger pool of, of speakers without having to worry about the added expense of travel. In addition, we have expanded the pool of listeners. People from all over the country come to our meetings. I even have a musician friend in New Zealand who has attended. This has enabled us to reach more people with the HLAA mission and message. We have had 80 to 90 people at many of our meetings with a high of 125. Presenting quality programs and putting them on Zoom are not the only reasons for our large attendance. We have publicized them extensively. A week before each meeting, we, place, we pay to place a story in an online magazine, West Side Rag, with a description of the upcoming program. I also email a long list of, in, of uh, ENTs and audiologists and interested others. The chapter sends out an e-blast to a mailing list, which has grown to about 800 people, partly through adding people from all over who have registered for past meetings. Many of the people on the list are not New Yorkers. I post information about the meetings on our chapter Facebook page and also on a Facebook page of the hearing loss forum. In addition, I send the information to my college class listserv, which has attracted several classmates to attend. All of our meetings are captioned by an expert captioner who has also recorded the meetings for subsequent viewings on YouTube. Some of those recordings have been viewed by as many as, many as 70 to 75 times. For those of you who are interested, you can find links to all of these meetings on our chapter website, hearinglossnyc.org. 
where you can also find information about upcoming meetings. Several of these meetings have been about musical topics and or cochlear implants. We hope in the near future to be able to return to meeting in person, but even at that time, we plan to make our meetings hybrid so that people from outside of New York City can participate. New York City members are, who are still not comfortable in large groups will also be able to come. We are currently looking for a venue to hold our meetings because the church, pre uh, the church basement we used pre-pandemic is no longer available. We may need to install a loop in a new venue since we could not take the one from the church with us. The walk for hearing has also been hybrid the past two years with one of our board members doing video of the activities for those who cannot come in person. I think we will continue that in the future. Although the monthly programs are the chapter centerpiece, we have been engaged in many other activities advocating on a variety of fronts, but you don't need to necessarily advocate on large issues. Self-advocacy is part of the HLAA message. I would encourage all of you to advocate for yourself when you need accommodations and to remember that when you advocate for yourself, you are creating awareness about hearing loss and advocating for the entire hearing loss community. When the New York Philharmonic announced that they were doing a major renovation of their hall, several of our members met with Lincoln Center administrators and successfully lobbied for them to include a hearing loop in the plans. The hall reopened with this fall with the loop, uh, which I've not yet had the experience of uh, the opportunity to experience. The chapter has contributed to open captioning of a Broadway show, as have many individual board members, and when there is not open captioning, many shows have captioning available on an app called Gala Pro. I don't think I can claim that the chapter is responsible for that, but a board member was actively involved. The chapter was also part of a lobbying effort that successfully got the city council to pass legislation requiring movie theaters to open caption 25% of their screenings of films every week if they are screening more than a certain number of showings. We have also been involved in lobbying to get New York State to establish a commission for the deaf, deaf, blind, and hard of hearing. The State Senate and Assembly ratified the legislation, which recently was vetoed by the governor. We will certainly continue to work on getting the legislation enacted. enacted. <laughs> One initiative that is especially close to my heart is to get the city to mandate school screening for hearing loss. There is a state requirement from which the city is exempt, but we are working to get screening in schools because we believe it is essential for children to get the interventions they require for development of language and to succeed in school and after. Under the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, Schools are required to give children the services they need, but screening is necessary in order to identify those needs. Through the generosity of one of our members, two years ago, we established an annual $5,000 scholarship, which is awarded to a graduating senior with hearing loss. Board members have also been active in the area of health care, particularly in hospitals. When I had my CI surgery, I was provided with live captioning in the recovery room and at the audiologist when my implant was activated. We are also very proud of our semi-monthly newsletter, which is emailed to our large mailing list. Even with our successes, the ch chapter is faced with difficult challenges. Although we raise large amounts of money for the walk for hearing, Almost all of it comes from board members and our friends and relatives, and almost all of the work done by the chapter is done by the board. We need to do a better job of involving the members who come to our meetings. We also need to improve diversity on the board and on our membership, both with respect to ethnicity and age. If we are not reaching all sections of the community, we have not truly fulfilled our mission. I am 73, but many board members are older. We need to groom younger people who will succeed us in running the chapter. 
younger members can also drag us into the 21st century by helping us to use social media better, a skill that is lacking on our board, whose social media skills, even on Facebook, are limited. We've been told that if we wish to, in, to attract younger members, we really need to use Instagram, something that nobody on the board knows how to use. Our next meeting will be Tuesday, this coming Tuesday from 6 to 7.30, when the topic will be hearing safety for people with hearing loss. You can find out information about this meeting and other meetings, as I mentioned, at our uh, chapter website, hearinglossnyc.org. Thank you for having me, and I'll be happy to answer any questions.